Southeast San Diego County to introduce you to native milkweeds. Milkweeds in general are the host plants of monarch butterflies. Narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepius vesicularis, is easy to identify by its long pointy leaves that grow along the main stem, which is tall and erect. It's not often that you find patches of narrow leaf milkweed this large. It grows in coastal sage scrub and chaparral plant communities, and it really likes these low swales like we found here. The flower develops in summer at the top of the plant. You can see it develops these flower clusters or umbrals, which actually consist of many little flowers that are the true flowers, probably 20 of them here or so. And each flower singularly has five petals and these long lobes that extend back which are often anywhere from lavender to pink to even greenish colored. Narrow leaf milkweed is a wonderful example of a native plant that supports not only the threatened Western monarch, but an incredible diversity of pollinators and other insects. By late summer, the pollinated flowers start to set seed. They develop long, smooth pods. These will slowly dry and split, releasing seeds that are taken on a breeze by silky hairs or pappus. Not only are Western monarch populations in decline, but the habitats that support narrow leaf milkweed are becoming scarcer throughout Southern California. This limits food resources, not only for monarch butterflies, but for native bumblebees, pepsis wasps, milkweed bugs, clearwing moths, and countless other unique and beneficial insects. We at EDI want to thank you for learning more about Western monarchs and their native habitats, and for committing to plant more native milkweeds while encouraging monarchs to migrate by cutting back your ornamental and tropical milkweeds in winter. Thanks for doing your part to protect milkweed and monarchs. Okay. So today I've gathered four. Sorry, I'm just going to get right back to the presentation here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. There we go. You did. Full screen. It's just being a little slow. Um, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, I have some background noise here. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know why it's not going to the full slideshow mode. Um, let's try that. Sorry about the delay. Okay, well, it's not operating properly, so I'm just going to go ahead and carry on and hopefully it'll catch up. So as I mentioned, I work for the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County, and we are a special district covering a large proportion of San Diego County and working on a variety of environmental conservation programs. Um, including fire safety. We have um, a new cost chipping program for local residents and we do fire safety education and some forest health programs. We also do environmental education, particularly working on watershed education for elementary school students and um, environmental stewardship programs for high school students. We also do a lot of education from the farm we manage down in the South Bay called Wild Willow Farm. We operate two community gardens, one in Benita and one in the Tijuana River Valley. And we work on carbon farming programs, supporting farmers and other land managers to adopt land management practices that sequester carbon in the soil and bring about a host of other environmental co-benefits. And another of our key work areas is on pollinator health. We started this work in 2014 when news about the monarch de population declines um, became known and we knew we wanted to do something to help. And through that work, we started getting in contact with other agencies and organizations working on pollinator health issues. And that eventually led to the beginning of the San Diego Pollinator Habitat or San Diego Pollinator Alliance. Um, but first we wanted to kind of put into context what's going on with the monarch and why we felt this work was so important. 
Um, just a quick background, you probably know that there are two main populations of monarch butterflies here in the United States. Um, one in the west of the country and one in the east of the country. Um, the eastern, so the western monarch population is west of the Rockies and the eastern population is east of the Rockies and they're, that's the population known for the amazing migration that they make to Mexico, but really both populations do migrate. The western monarch migrates from California and western states over to the California coast during the winter where they overwinter at sites along the coast and then when spring comes back, they migrate back into their summer breeding grounds. And then the eastern population um, migrates down south to Mexico during like late summer, fall, roosts up in trees during the winter. And then in spring, when milkweed emerges and flowering plants emerge, they start making that journey back up north. And that's what you see these arrows doing is kind of portraying the direction that these monarchs travel. And these migrations are fueled by milkweed and by nectar, so flowering plants. And so scientists have been studying the monarch migration and over the past 20 years have noticed some pretty severe declines in the populations of monarchs overwintering in Mexico and in California. So for the Eastern population, it's estimated that that population fell from about 384 million in 1996 to a low of 14 million in 2013. And it rebounded a little bit and was at about 60 million in 2019. The Western population, however, has not, has, we've seen even more severe declines in that population. So from about 1.2 million um, in 1997 to fewer than 30 in 2019. And then this past winter, um, uh, less than 2,000 were observed at overwintering sites here in California. So that is a really shocking and severe decline in population for the Western monarch. And it just really rings home that now more than ever, it's important to take action to support the monarch and do what we can to help that population rebound. So organizations like the Xerces Society have been studying the monarch and pulling together information and resources. Um, they have a Western monarch call to action where they're encouraging people to take steps to support monarchs. And they've summed up five key steps that people can take to help the monarch recover, at least in the short term. These revolve around protecting overwintering sites here in California, restoring migratory and breeding habitat in California, protect, you know, pesticides are a really big problem. So we want to be able to protect monarch breeding habitat um, from pesticides. And then protecting that summer breeding and fall migration habitat outside of California is very important, as is research and understanding more about what's going on with the monarch and what we can do to aid its recovery. So that brings us back to the Pollinator Alliance and um, how we got started. Again, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, several organizations working on pollinator health came together in the mid 2010s um, when these numbers started making it out into the news. And several of us got together in 2015 to build a native pollinator garden at the fair, at the San Diego Fairgrounds. Um, the aim was to start to show people you know, to raise, real, to raise awareness of what was going on with pollinators and also to show people how you could create habitat using native plants. And the logos here that you see are all the current members of the San Diego Pollinator Alliance. We're really, you know, a network of agencies and organizations working together to support pollinators and also to raise awareness. Okay. So, you know, one of our main areas of work is to just help people create good habitat for pollinators. And that can range from small scale to large scale, from public to private land, from schools to home gardens to restoration projects. But the common thread of um, the pollinator habitat work that we do revolves around using native plants, both host plants and nectar plants. Um, so always promoting native milkweed and why we should be using that. And aiming to show people what beautiful habitat can be created using native plants and why it's important to do that. The Pollinator Alliance is headed by the RCD and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We meet quarterly. And then the beauty of working with so many wonderful partners is that each partner each organization brings different strengths and skills and enables us to get more work done together. So our objective is to support pollinators through education, outreach, and on-the-ground programs. We do a yearly exhibit at the San Diego County Fair. So that little pollinator garden that we started in 2015 has grown 
and we host it each year with, um, with volunteer docents and CMPS, the San Diego chapter has been such a great partner for this. You know, several of your members have served as volunteer docents to talk with the general public, to raise awareness about native plants, about native milkweed, and what we can all do to create good habitat. These gardens are meant to inspire people and to show them what they can do at home. Um, in addition to the fair garden, we've created a few other small scale demonstration gardens some at schools like at Lafayette Elementary School in Claremont and another at Scripps Ranch High School in Scripps Ranch. <laughs> um, and one of your um, wonderful members, Mike Gonzalez, led that effort um, as a part of the Pollinator Alliance. And also some, some gardens in public spaces at Sykes Adobe in Escondido and at Los Algaros Nature Preserve in Albrook. We're in the process of developing, developing a pollinator toolkit, which is a pack of resources that will help people create pollinator habitat at home. We're always working to formalize and grow the Pollinator Alliance. And we are finding, you know, we were able to now work on a long-term interest that we've had in creating a local seed source of native milk food, which um, has been working. Just a couple of quick pictures here of the pollinator trail at the county fair. You can see Jonathan in the green apron there and Pat, the other co-founder of Butterfly Farms there as well. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan to talk to you all about our Native Milkweed project. And I'm going to try to restart the slideshow. Thanks, Anne. Um, well, while you're uh, restarting the sli uh, slideshow, there was uh, somebody in the chat that um, provided a tip on how you might get that full screen, but it looks like it's going now. Um, so my name is Jonathan Snapcook. I work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in our Partners for Fish and Wildlife program. Uh, we work with private landowners to do conservation projects. And um, when we started working with the California Native Plant Society and Butterfly Farms, uh, the Resource Conservation District, uh, Sky Mountain Permaculture, and um, a handful of other partners, we um, focused our work on establishing native gardens that would support uh, pollinators because we felt that that was a really viable way for people in uh, San Diego County to um, get involved with the um, effort to conserve pollinators. And kind of all along with that was the effort to conserve the monarch butterfly. So, um, these are some photos from our pollinator garden at the slot at the uh, San Diego County Fair and the California Native Plant Society has really been a big part of this each year. Um, usually we have between uh, 20 and 35 volunteers, most of whom are from California Native Plant Society. And they really work alongside us and um, help to get uh, all the um, people who visit the fair in thinking about how they might build a small native plant garden at their home, uh, regardless of how big or how small. Um, we usually get about uh, between 50 and 70,000 visitors each year that go through the pollinator garden. And um, it's really inspiring to see people start to think about how they might use native plants around their um, home or their church or school um, to attract pollinators. Um, and we're going to be doing some uh, workshops later this year. Um, so we're looking for people who might be willing to be um, kind of mentors for more novice gardeners. So um, if you're in the audience and you think you'd like to share your native plant gardening skills with others, let us know. Or if you'd like to learn more about that, um, we're going to share a link to sign up for those uh, later on in the presentation. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide. So as we were doing our native plant uh, gardens, we were promoting uh, using native milkweeds in the gardens. And uh, we found that there was, a, um, there was a lack of native milkweed. It's going back and forth. Um, okay, so then in situating the work that we were doing for pollinators and monarchs, uh, the Xerces Society put out this sort of conservation um, plan with the first priority being the areas that are in this um, kind of aquamarine color. 
and San Diego County being in this priority one zone. And what they were recommending there is that in the Monarch's first stopover after they come out of their overwintering period, that we protect um, early season native milkweed and plant that native milkweed and also plant nectar plants for the Monarch. So in doing that, we started um, promoting using native milkweed. You can go to the next slide. And we found a couple of things when we were um, starting to ask our local native plant nurseries for native narrow leaf milkweed. We found that most of the narrow leaf milkweed that was being sold in Southern California was from sources in Central California. And uh, we found in some places where we were growing these with um, people who had plants that were growing in their kind of backyard wild area, that the um, that the ones that were local to San Diego did a little bit better. So we were thinking that the um, seeds that were collected in San Diego were better adapted to the uh, climate and soils in our county. So we wanted to try to uh, see if we could gather seeds from the wild and start a source of narrow leaf milkweed that was uh, collected locally. Um, also at that time, um, the messaging was coming out more strongly against using tropical milkweed, which you can see here um, with the red and yellow flowers there in the corner. Uh, the one slide to the um, right-hand side of the screen is in the top corner is the Areocarpa, and on the left side of the screen is the narrow leaf milkweed with a, a monarch butterfly on it. All right, next slide. So in searching, um, in starting our research, we thought we should also look at what other um, milkweed species aside from narrow leaf milkweed grew in Southern California. So this chart shows some of the um, native milkweeds. There are six different native milkweed species that are found in San Diego County. Three of those are mostly found in our desert areas and three on our uh, coastal side and in our foothills. Um, and then a few um, other species are in the broader Southern California area, but I'm gonna focus on the San Diego County ones. Next slide. The next three slides are maps comparing the distribution of, of two different milkweeds on each slide. So in this um, slide, the green triangles are the narrow leaf milkweeds. You can see they're um, as far east as kind of our low foothills, a little bit east of Escondido there. And then in the purple dot is the Asclepius albans, and that's um, more in our desert areas. And go to the next slide. In this slide, we have the Asclepius californica in the blue squares. Um, it's not found as near the coast as the narrow leaf milkweed. And then in the orange circles is the Asclepius erosa, uh, more in the kind of drier parts of the mountain and out through the desert. And then you can go to the next slide. Uh, this last of the map slides shows uh, Asclepius areocarpa, and it'll either have a cream color flower or kind of a pink roses color flower. Uh, that is up and around kind of the Escondido area, the lower mountains. And um, then the other one on this slide is the Asclepius subulata, which really has small leaves and a uh, kind of uh, whitish green colored flower. And again, that's out in the desert. So next slide. So for our first, um, trial here, we used the, we decided to focus our efforts on the narrow leaf milkweed. Um, and in order to get collection from the wild, what we wanted to do is see where we could uh, find populations of narrow leaf milkweed that we could collect from. So um, myself, along with um, an intern named Tori Hossi, worked with the data from the California Consortium of Herbariums 
uh, cow flora, and also iNaturalist. And we mapped these uh, with help from Emily Luciani in our GIS department in relation to uh, public lands. And we were able to find a handful of public lands where we were able to get um, access to. The city of Carlsbad gave us access to some of their sites. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife gave us access to a site in Carlsbad and a site in Hamul. And we also collected on a US Fish and Wildlife property, uh, as well as a couple other um, like daily ranch around Escondido we had permission to collect. Um, and that slide there shows a monarch uh, flying through kind of a, a willow forest where we found some of our milkweed. Next slide. Uh, the next few slides are just pictures of the milkweed growing in the uh, natural habitat. And uh, something that you may not have seen before, these are at the Carlsbad Ecological Reserve, which is a California Department of Fish and Wildlife property. And um, in the lower picture, you can see they're growing in a riparian area. And those milkweed plants get up to uh, six to seven feet tall. Next slide. Uh, in this slide, we have Allison Anderson, an entomologist at the US Fish and Wildlife Service, who I work with a lot and is really knowledgeable on monarchs, and Gabriel Pinaflor, uh, an environmental scientist at California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, this particular habitat was kind of a year round marsh that supported uh, several hundred milkweed plants. The purple uh, that you can see in this slide is these uh, gauze sort of uh, wedding gift bags, and we found that those worked pretty good to collect the seeds with. And then uh, the other side here is a monarch flying um, right next to where these two people are standing, and uh, in the background there is a lemonade berry. Next slide. This is down in Hamul. This is a little bit uh, drier site, but still in a drainage. Uh, there weren't as many milkweed plants here, but you can see they're about uh, three and a half feet tall. And then there's a uh, monarch egg that we found on those plants out in the Hamul Ecological Reserve. Next slide. So um, the project that we're talking about today is our effort to collect uh, narrow leaf milkweed seeds from the wild and bring them into um, controlled propagation settings. And then hopefully um, this year and next year, we will start to be able to have those locally collected plants uh, available for the public. So what we're doing in this project is we're collecting seeds from wild populations of native milkweed. Uh, we're working with local native plant nurseries to propagate the seeds. And also Mary Duffy is gonna talk about a seed farm that we've created with the Earth Discovery Institute. And um, like I said, hopefully this year and next year, we'll start to have uh, seeds and plants from those uh, native source, those natural sources. Next slide. So last year was our first year um, working on this project. We were able to collect some seeds from the um, sources that I mentioned. Uh, we started growing them with uh, three or four different uh, local nurseries. And um, then as I mentioned, EDI is gonna talk about their experience with those. Uh, this is our second year of the project. Uh, this year, what we did was we involved land managers with our seed collection effort um, through the MSCP. A lot of uh, land managers were interested in helping us with the conservation efforts for the monarch butterfly. So they were able to um, know of populations that they had on their land and collect the seed for us. And then we uh, got those all together and then we distributed them to our uh, growers. And this year we um, started working with SNS Seeds and um, Native West Nursery to um, try some other methods of getting the seeds grown up into plants. And then uh, the third year, we hope to be able to have larger amounts of seeds produced and hopefully be able to start uh, selling those and giving those to the public. 
Uh, the pictures here on this slide, um, the first uh, picture is some milkweed seeds just coming out of the pod. The second one there is some of the one gallon milkweed plants. Uh, the third one is at Butterfly Farms Nursery, and they've been really successful in propagating the native milkweeds. And then the last one is a monarch caterpillar on the narrow leaf milkweed. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that we want to stress in this presentation is the importance of all the different partners we've worked with. Um, we've worked with a broad range of partners, both uh, local conservation groups, um, as well as local nurseries. And then we've worked with several land managers, but each different partner brings something uh, different to the partnership. And um, together we've been working on uh, just sharing the information and doing the best we can to get these um, native wild collected seeds growing in a uh, nursery setting. Next slide. Um, we gave this talk recently to the California uh, Resource Conservation District's um, annual conference. So we had people from all over the state who were interested in doing the similar things. So we provided some uh, suggestions on if you do this project, if you do the same thing. And our suggestions were to monitor the sites regularly, uh, try different methods of collecting the seeds. We found in some areas there was a little bit too much uh, fog and drizzle and those uh, wetting bags got wet and kind of, kind of mildewed a little bit. And um, so you might need to use different methods. Um, and kind of the main thing that was our key to success is once we got familiar with our sites in the second year, uh, we were able to collect a lot more seed off of those sites by our you know, just getting our timing right. Next slide. I will now hand it over to Mary Duffy of the Earth Discovery Institute, and she will tell you a little bit more about the um, work that her group did. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Duffy with the Earth Discovery Institute. Can you hear me? I think you can, okay. Um, it's, it's so odd to be speaking in a box here without a real live audience, but anyway, it's um, high out there. Um, uh, the Earth Discovery Institute is um, partners in that, and part of the San Diego Pollinator Alliance and we're partners with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we're a science-based environmental education and outreach nonprofit in San Diego, Southeast County. Um, we also partner with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Endangered Habitats Conservancies, and other regional nonprofits and school districts on various conservation and restoration efforts. Because of our structure and partnerships, um, Earth Discovery Institute is uniquely positioned to help with native milkweed and Western monarch monitoring and conservation. Next slide. Um, we also collect um, um, milkweed seed for this effort for Jonathan and Ann and the overall San Diego Pollinator Alliance effort in South County. Um, so we're, we are, um, our actual location is more in East South County out in the Hamul area. And we do a lot of work on the San Diego National Wildlife Refuge, Rancho Hamul Ecological Reserve, Otai Mountains, and then up into the Cuyamacas and Lagunas. Um, we started collaborating with the San Diego Pollinator Alliance by identifying populations of narrow leaf milkweed and collecting seed in Southeast San Diego County in um, 2020, 2019 and 20. And um, we are lucky to have an incredible group of volunteers, including some CNPS folks that help us collect, clean and weigh milkweed over the last two years, we've collected over 80 grams of local native milkweed seed, which may not seem a lot, seem to be a lot, but if you've ever tried to weigh one milkweed seed, you'll understand why they are very light. And that's also part of the reason I think in the past that there were problems with um, milk, people trying to um, grow milkweed from seed from North, uh, mid and Northern California, where would you buy it from SNS or some other seed company. I don't 
think, and I don't know for sure because I haven't been doing this long enough. One year is not long enough to say I'm an expert about growing milkweed, but I, I don't think it has a very long life, the seed in terms of viability. It's very, 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 a not a dense seed, doesn't have a lot of nutrients, I think, stored in the seed. So I think fresh seed is probably the reason that we had such incredible success. Next slide. So we also started um, germinating and growing narrow leaf milkweed. Um, we experimented with um, growing milkweed from seed. We did try growing some from cuttings. We didn't have success. I know other people have, especially some of the commercial nurseries, um, um, Musa Creek and Recon or Native West have grown milkweed in the past from cuttings, but we didn't have any success with that. So we had so much success with growing it from seed that for reasons of genetic diversity, we decided to stick with that. So we processed and planted two seeds, two seeds that were either treated or untreated. And the treatment we used was the uh, cold stratification treatment as outlined by, um, uh, I think it's the Fish and Wildlife Service document that Jonathan gave me. It's pretty straightforward and simple. It's um, Take your seed, add a little, little moist, some vermiculite and a little moisture to it and stick it in the refrigerator at about 40 degrees for, um, we stuck in the refrigerator from anywhere to two to four months. I think it could also help it if it was shorter or longer, but um, that was our cold stratification treatment. Um, then we took those seeds and we sowed them both in a, in a greenhouse into pots half treated, half untreated, and we sowed direct ground in a milkweed farm. Um, we also transplanted some seedlings that were started by butterfly farms in North County, direct to ground, just to see, to compare that to what we were doing with um, seeds that we had initially just started from those seeds we collected. Uh, this was the first time I'd ever grown now, any of us had ever grown narrow leaf milkweed. So um, it was all new to us. And for a while I was getting pretty depressed because nothing was coming up. And almost to the point of thinking that nothing was gonna happen. And um, when, when it warmed up to about 80 degrees, everything took off. And last year that was about in March, about the time COVID hit and everything went crazy. All of a sudden um, our milkweed seeds started germinating and we had more milkweed than we could imagine. Um, we got about 50% germination from untreated, unstratified seeds, and about 70% germination from stratified seeds. And the highest germination rate was the direct to ground planting, which I'll go into here, here at our bottom milkweed farm. So basically, it, we came down to the conclusion that seedlings from stratified seeds do grow faster and more robustly, and they do better than transplants from pots. Next slide. So our South County uh, native milkweed farm is in Lakeside. It's on some property um, uh, owned by Endangered Habitats Conservancy. And they happen to have a piece of land out there that was sort of perfect to experiment with uh, starting a milkweed farm because it had been a riding arena. So it was already flat and um, with a little bit of um, cleaning and maintenance, we didn't really, we didn't augment the soil in any way. It's real sandy, DG, basically not very exciting soil. Um, we did use a little bit of mulch on top, but we, at the South County Mac, uh, Milkweed Farm is where we started uh, testing growing seeds direct to ground. Um, it, the, the goal of the South County Milkweed Farm is to um, have a farm that produces milkweed seed and enough to um, create a seed bank for locally sourced uh, native milkweed seeds. So that in the future, we won't be harvesting so much seed from the wild. Um, and site prep included irrigation. Um, I will say that narrow leaf milkweed loves water. And so anybody who's tried to grow it and hasn't um, had problems growing it, I think one of the main reasons is we're all, in growing native plants, I'm always looking for um, plants that don't need a lot of water. And um, that's part of the big selling point with native plants, of course, in San Diego County, but milkweed loves water and narrow leaf milkweed really likes water. So 
we had to put in a drip irrigation system and we had it on timers and it um, watered the soil enough to keep it damp at all times, even in the hardest, hottest parts of summer. So we planted over 200 non-stratified seeds, 200 stratified seeds and 30 plants from containers, which uh, were plants we got from butterfly farms that they had started about four months in advance. Um, the cold stratified seeds grew taller and more robust than those that were not treated. And germination was so successful, as you can see here, this is actually after we thinned the row, we had to thin the seedlings. Um, because we started so late, we got started so late because of all the prep work and stuff we had to do. Um, we didn't really get plants in the ground till May. We didn't have very many plants fully mature and set seed. Um, but that's also unusual for, for first year plants from seed, I guess, in milkweeds. They do better the second year. The first year they put most of their energy into um, developing roots and um, sending out rhizomes. So um, it'll be really interesting to see how well they come back this year in those areas that we planted. And this year we'll also be planting uh, Asclepias aerocarpa to add to the um, composition and see how well that does and what it takes to grow. Next slide, please. Just some tips for growing um, narrow leaf milkweed. Down there you can see um, Rick setting up our irrigation system and how really unexciting that soil was. Um, locally sourced seeds germinate easily. And I, I will say fresh locally sourced seeds because this y'all experiment with two-year-old seed, but um, if, it's, if it's locally sourced seed that's adapted to this Southern California climate, it germinates easily. So I don't really think there's any advantage to propagating from root cuttings or plant cuttings. Um, a good tip is collecting um, seeds using gauze bags, as Jonathan pointed out. Of course, you can only do that on private property, but it does work really well. And it also um, helps keep out milkweed bugs and a few other things that can deplete your um, seed pods. Um, cold stratifying seeds in refrigerator at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit for six weeks or four months helps germination. Um, cold stratified seeds sow direct to ground show the best results. And once planted, the seeds will not sprout until it's warm enough, which is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Don't give up. It, last year it didn't warm up for quite a while. So um, it was amazing how fast the plants came up once they started, once it warmed up, and then you have to keep them moist. You have to keep the soil moist, moist to grow narrowly from milkweed, but it loves full sun. Next slide. Of course, the biggest problem is all of you folks know who grow any plants are the pests and diseases. And of course, milkweed um, has its fair share. Aphids love it. Um, they, uh, the, the aphid that is, that attacks the milkweed around here is the non-native oleander aphid. And, um, the infestation can be heavy enough that it can suck all the juices out of, uh, even a stem leading up to a flower head so that the flower heads don't even fully develop. So you can't, if you're trying to, um, grow any sort of pollinator plants for insects, you can't use pesticides. So Hand removing is the best. You will never get rid of all the aphids, but if you can just keep the population down, that's the best thing you can do. If you notice ants, they like to um, get the honeydew from the aphids, so they will actually farm the aphids. So if you can control ants that are crawling up and down the stems, that helps too. They will move the aphids around. Um, some people are proponents of spraying them off with the hose with a, you know, a firm stream from a hose, but I wonder if that wouldn't dislodge um, monarch milkweed, uh, monarch eggs. So I'm not sure about that one, but I usually remove them with gloves because I don't like that orange, orange stain that they leave on your hands. Um, small milkweed bugs are another pest. I don't see them as much out here as the large milkweed bugs, but they're um, the orange and black um, insects that have, um, they kind of have a red X on their back they suck sap from the plant. And amazingly enough, they will also sometimes attack small caterpillars. Uh, the nymphs, the, there's five uh, nymph stages and they are bright orange and they can be found in these large clusters like in this photograph up here, it's actually large milkweed bug nymphs. 
And uh, the best thing to do is remove them manually. You can um, kind of try to shake them off the plant or, um, you know, just if you don't like squeezing them, you can just take a, a, a jar of soapy water and just plop them in there as you go along. And sort of the same thing with the large milkweed bugs. They, they, um, they normally don't deplete a plant so much that it can't produce seed pods, but sometimes they can seem like the populations are pretty big. And this is where the gauze bags really do help out if you're doing this on your own property. You can just put a gauze bag on there, make sure you get all the milkweed bugs off and then uh, put a gauze bag over there. And if you tighten it enough around the bottom, uh, I find the milkweed bugs don't tend to get in. One or two will get in, but not a lot. And then other people talk a lot about root fungus. We've never had any, or root rot, we've never had any issues with it here because I think it's so dry, even though we're watering, we're augmenting with water. Um, it's, it's a very dry climate. So I have not, we did not find, uh, have issues with root rot in the greenhouse setting, greenhouse setting or in the ground. But we also have to remember about um, mycorrhizal fungal, fungi, they're, they're crucial to the plant's uh, health and they deliver nitrogen and phosphorus to the plant in exchange for sugar. So they're a good thing too. Our biggest problem this year has been gophers. I noticed in the Q and A, somebody pointed that out to the gophers. They do eat milkweed roots. You know, we we thought in the beginning that they wouldn't because of the um, cardiac glycosides that are in toxins that are in milkweed, but they don't tend to concentrate in the roots. So um, gophers go right for the roots. Um, people opt to grow and raise beds, trap the gophers, or do as we've done here, which we've created these giant. You can see this in the lower left-hand photo. These giant. Um, root cage beds, which we're going to give a try this year and see if we can keep gophers out that way. Next slide. Um, EDI um, supports a lot of programs and a lot of different things. But when it comes to milkweed in um, Western monarchs, we strive to raise awareness of the decline of Western monarchs and the need to grow native milkweeds and not grow tropical milkweeds. Uh, we promote safe saving animals from extinction practices, which is promoted by the San Diego Zoo. Um, we produce educational materials about pre best practices for protecting monarchs and growing native milkweed. We're expanding our South County milkweed farm so that we can also grow um, other pollinator plants, other plants that support pollinators and also other milkweeds. And we provide locally sourced native milkweed seeds for restoration and conservation effort, efforts to other agencies and regional growers. Um, we're also working to further identify where native milkweed species naturally occur and identify sites frequented by Western monarchs, especially in our neck of the woods in Southeast San Diego County and age researchers in determining if there are resident or non-migratory monarchs, which is gonna be a really difficult proposition, but um, we're willing to help work on that one too. We also wanna create native plant palettes for native plant pollinator gardens and facilitate programs that advance these methods. And um, I'm really interested in documenting other pollinators and insects that support that are supported with um, in native milkweed habitats. Um, there was a slide somewhere earlier that showed a bumblebee. Um, on one of the um, milkweed plants, it's actually crotches, crotches bumblebee that is um, um, up for listing as an endangered species. There's a lot of endangered bumblebees in um, California, throughout the nation actually. And um, we're hoping um, that in our efforts to protect the monarch that we protect also a lot of the other important pollinators. Because as you can notice through the slideshow, milkweeds, our native milkweeds support a lot of pollinators. Um, if you work in them long enough, you'll, you'll notice that the um, predominant pollinator actually of milkweeds is the Pepsis, the big Pepsis tarantula hawk wasp. And um, as horrifying as their reputation is, you can easily work in them when they're nectaring, they don't really bother you at all. And um, the populations, they, when they're working a, a narrow leaf milkweed patch can be pretty heavy. But it's really exciting that the diversity of insects that just um, use narrow leaf milkweed, probably any milkweeds as a resource. It's, it's a 
pretty, pretty important plant uh, along with all the other milkweeds. I think that's it for me. Yep. Okay, sorry, it's just not moving along. Let's go over here. There we go. Thanks, Mary. Okay, so, you know, as we've gone about, you know, this project and entering into year two now, we've learned some lessons along the way. Um, this has been a really great project to work on collaboratively. You know, as we've mentioned before, partnership has been key and, you know, many people bring different strengths. So it's been great. Jonathan mentioned that here in year two, we reached out for help from landowners. And that's something that we wish we would have thought about sooner because the first year with our limited efforts, we collected something like nine grams of seed, but this year it was upwards of 120. So, you know, it really um, made a difference to have so much extra help and we're really grateful for that. Using digital forms um, for data collection and for getting input back from the growers who are working on this has been really helpful, just makes it so much easier to process that information. You really wanna be working on um, strategies on propagation and planting to share that with other people um, so that they can also have success with native milkweed. And really, you know, this is a great project. We're so glad to be working on it, but it does take a fair amount of time and coordination. So we're really happy to have some funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service and others to keep this work going. Okay, so next steps for the project. As Jonathan mentioned, we are working on scaling up the amount of seed and plants that we're able to produce so that we can sell them and um, give some away as well. And as that supply builds up, we wanna be able to market the milkweed to more nurseries so that you know the, it can be wider reaching across the county. We really feel that messaging is important. We wanna raise awareness of the importance of using native and especially local milkweed. But we also realize that it's important that everybody's kind of on the same page when we share messaging. So we will be use, utilizing some existing well-respected materials like the Monarch Safe materials that were mentioned earlier to promote um, milkweed and native habitat. Uh, one of the kind of ideas for the project is creating a branded ta plant tag so that the San Diego native milkweed is easily identifiable no matter where you're buying it. And we want to make this project have a bigger regional reach. So we'll be networking with others growing native milkweed in Southern California. Um, and eventually we want to be working with municipalities to encourage them to include native milkweed and other pollinator plants in landscaping and restoration projects. This is an example it's safe um, monarch campaign that we've mentioned. This was developed by the AZA, the American Zoological Association. Um, the San Diego Zoo is a member of that and they were you know, a key part of putting this together. Um, this campaign has several visuals with very um, concise messaging that can be utilized throughout the year, um, kind of seasonal messages. But um, some of the important ones are, you know, feed the migration using native plants um, and flowers. And there's, I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen, it seems to have cut off on mine, but there's a message about, oh, here it is, cutting down tropical milkweed during um, the, the late fall and winter to keep it safe from diseases. Tropical milkweed doesn't die back like our native milkweeds do. They go winter, you know, the native milkweeds go winter dormant. So those plants are kind of cleaned of diseases like OE, whereas tropical milkweed does not die down in the winter. So that disease persists and gets passed on to monarchs. We're gonna to to share all these links that are in the presentation in the chat as well, and we can circulate them afterwards in case you wanna learn more about this campaign. We also have some calls to action. Um, you know, There's so much we can all do to support monarchs and anything that we do to support monarchs is gonna support other pollinators and wildlife too. Um, a mantra to consider is plant nectar, plant native, plant now. Um, we really would love to encourage people to participate in monarch community science efforts as well, um, especially year round. You know, a lot of that happens um, in the spring and in the fall or in the summer when monarchs are really visible and around. But we really need to know more about what's happening in the fall and the winter too. Here in San Diego, it seems as though we may have a resident population. We're not really seeing any monarchs at the known overwintering sites. So by monitoring monarchs movements and the presence of milkweed year round, that will really contribute to science and understanding of what's going on with monarchs. Um, if you wanna contribute observations, the Xerces Society Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper is a great one to um, add your data to. The link is here in the presentation, but again, we'll share that in the chat. 
And um, if you are so inclined to run, walk, hike, bike, paddle, um, swim, or whatever, miles to support and celebrate monarchs, um, there is a Miles for Monarch campaign that Monarch Joint Venture and Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever are coordinating across the nation. They're inviting people to, it's kind of like a virtual 5K type thing. Um, so throughout the year, they're inviting people to run or whatever your favorite exercise is to support um, and raise awareness of the monarch. If you do decide to register for that, you can um, list, you can tick San Diego Pollinator Alliance as the referring partner if you would like. Okay, and Jonathan mentioned earlier that we're planning a series of native pollinator habitat workshops. Um, the, this will kind of cover, these workshops will cover all the steps you need to know to create a pollinator garden at your home or school or whatever space you utilize. Um, the first workshop is happening on February 24th at 4 p.m. There's lots of ways to get involved beyond attending a workshop. Um, we're gonna try to see if we can set up a pollinator garden mentor program to pair up a more experienced gardener with a less experienced gardener to create gardens together and help them thrive. And there's also some habitat restoration projects and um, milkweed projects that would really welcome volunteers. So um, we're gonna share the link to how you would sign up for the February 24th workshop. That same link includes um, boxes that you can tick to register interest in the other activities as well. Uh, just a quick thank you to the organizations and agencies that support this project through funding or other ways of support, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, National Wildlife Refuge, the US Fish and Wildlife um, Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, the Wildlife Conservation Board, the Milk Nature Fund, and um, thank you too to Mary and Jonathan for the beautiful photos in this presentation and to Colin Richards who created the, the Native Milkweed video that we saw at the beginning. Um, we'll take questions from you all, but if anything pops into your mind after this presentation and you want to get in touch, please feel free um, to contact any one of us. And that is all. Joseph, do you want to, us to kind of tackle the Q&A or do you want to kind of help us build that a little? Yeah, uh, yeah you, you go ahead and uh, just stop the uh, share screen and then uh, there are 50 something questions you can pick from in the Q&A section. We have about, uh, about 12 or 13 minutes. So uh, you uh, pick whatever seems most relevant. I'll, I'll read through them if you guys don't mind. Jonathan, I think this one's for you. What is an early season milkweed species? Muted. Jonathan, are you still on mute? I am unmuted. <laughs> um, okay, so um, just to kind of put it out there, we did get quite a few questions uh, in the Q&A. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to get all of them in 12 minutes, but um, we really appreciate um, everybody turning out for the presentation. We had about 200 people on the um, face or on the Zoom, and about 60 people on Facebook. So, um, obviously, a lot of really important questions, and um, you know, everybody's trying to do what they can. And so, we appreciate all of your interest. Um, more than likely, you can find your answer by googling <laughs> the question you had, but. Uh, maybe we can take some of these questions and uh, post them on the CNPS website um, or something like that. Um, early season milkweeds, what they're concerned about here is that the climate change is causing the butterflies to leave the overwintering sites earlier than normal. So the thinking is that um, as they leave those overwintering sites, they're going to be looking for milkweed out in the wild. And so some researchers have looked at which milkweeds tend to um, sprout up and present themselves earlier than others. In central and Northern California, they're looking towards the California milkweed to fulfill this role. But in San Diego, a lot of times in March and April, we start to see our uh, milkweed plants that are over two to three years um, start to sprout. So, I mean, I think that narrow leaf milkweed in San Diego County is a decent possibility for an, an early season milkweed, even though in more Northern parts of California, they're thinking of it as a late season plant. 
Um, I'll field this question here from Rob Wood uh, about monarchs laying eggs on sprouts this winter and is narrow leaf not dying back now? I, I did see a phenomenon this year and I think it was just because it got stayed so warm through December where um, a lot of the wild milkweed, the narrow leaf milkweed um, actually started growing again from the ground. But it, it seemed like it um, just sort of sprouted up, got a couple inches high, did produce a lot of leaves and now it has died back again. So um, I don't know if that's, I don't know, Jonathan, if you've ever seen that happen before or if it's just unique to this year because we've had such a warm, um, we had such a warm November and December. And then we had that crazy rain late in November and I just think it prompted a lot of the milkweed to start growing again, but it, it has died back now. Yeah, something odd all the time. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and that's the other um, component of all this is climate change and, um, you know, and how that's factoring into everything, the, the milkweed growing and also the monarchs and their migration and um, their wintering sites. It's, it's changing things pretty quickly. I think what we found through doing the work with the Pollinator Alliance is that there's, you know, we're kind of working in an ever-changing situation, but, um, you know, and a lot of the questions that people asked are really good and really detail-oriented, um, but kind of the advice that we provide to the public, what we meet at the fair and other people that we work with is just to try to get the basics of pollinator gardening down, and then just like with, um, you know, native plant gardens, over time, you kind of learn what works and what doesn't, and kind of what is um, a good practice and what didn't work for you. So the basics of making a pollinator garden are to try to um, have a variety of plants that will um, provide flowers and blooms throughout the growing season. So in San Diego, that's March through um, September, October. And so if you can plant um, native plants that flower throughout that period, you'll be um, benefiting the monarch butterfly because they'll have more nectar sources and also other pollinator species. The other thing after you get blooms spread out over the uh, growing season is you want to get flowers that have a variety of colors and shapes. And so although this presentation was focused on milkweed and for monarchs we think about you know, milkweed, 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 they also do need those nectar sources. So having a good diverse uh, native plant garden. Um, and I saw one person asked about uh, pots versus in the ground. You know, a lot of these plants and milkweed included, you can grow in pots on a patio. So even if you have a small space, and I think, you know, if anything is able to make the difference for a insect that's as in much trouble as the monarch, it's just going to be sort of all hands on deck and everybody doing a little bit of what they can. And I mean, like, you know, there's 60 questions in the chat. So, um, and a lot of them are very detailed questions and it is important to get that detailed information. Um, but I think more important is that people start to feel um, comfortable with gardening with natives. And, you know, there's a lot of questions about where you can buy these. Uh, certainly Musa Creek and Butterfly Farms and Native West all have you know, different ways that they sell their plants. And if you talk to the nursery people, a lot of times they will try to source something. But, um, you know, we're kind of, as we showed in our presentation, we're kind of trying to catch up, you know, year one, year two, year three. Um, none of these things are quick and easy solutions. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, you know, keep in contact with us and, um, certainly try to come to one of our workshops, but, um, you know, just in general, kind of uh, jumping in and starting a little pollinator garden and then learning from there is what I would recommend. That's the answer to all 60 questions. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody asked if we could um, email the links. Yeah, we can definitely share those. Um, that, that occurred throughout the presentation. Jonathan, there were a couple people too that said that they, um, even though this is a San Diego based webinar, is the information also valid for the Los Angeles area? Yeah, I saw a couple of those. So this information is probably pretty sound up through Los Angeles, but then when you get north of Los Angeles, uh, you're probably gonna get a different suite of milkweed 
plants, a little bit different on the horticulture, but um, that's how I would say for the geographical uh, worthiness of our talk. And I know a lot of, more of those. people are um, um, asking about seed availability, and I know that's a tough one because it's that we're so limited in the amount of locally sourced seed that we have right now. But I do um, suggest that if you buy seed from any other company, you just ask them where it's sourced from. And usually there, everybody's more than willing to tell you where it is sourced from, so. I mean, also, um, you know, we highlighted a couple of different reasons that we're focusing on the wild collected milkweed. Um, you know, until that's more, readily available, there's nothing wrong with using the native milkweed that's not locally sourced. Um, you know, we're just trying to solve a problem which is in general important to us native plant folks in San Diego, which is to preserve our local diversity. And really what I would hope is that by this effort, we're able to start having the locally sourced seed for restoration projects when we're actually putting the milkweed in back out into the wild, um, but for you know gardens in your backyard and whatnot, you know hopefully the native seed from our local collections will do better down here. But um, using those narrow leaf plants and the other species in your backyard is, I, for now, still not something that you should worry too awful much about. And I've noticed too that some people have grown um, other species from California up the coast and stuff like that. I think if you can get any um, um, any milkweed to grow that goes dormant in the winter that's native to North America, I, I think you're fine. For the garden setting. For the garden then, setting, yes, not for restoration yeah. effort, but yeah. Anyway, we really appreciate all the questions in the chat. Um, do you want to try a couple more questions? And then um, maybe Joseph, if you can uh, show us how to save all these questions, and then maybe we can put together a, uh, a question and answer for your website or something. Yeah, we'll definitely save you all the questions. Yeah, there's a lot of questions here and there's a lot of great questions. I really couldn't answer them all at once. Um, Anne, are there any that you want to answer? I was just noticing one just came through about um, if we have a link for what plants usually put in pollinator gardens with the milkweed. Um, yeah, we've been working on developing a plant list um, to like a good plant list to use for pollinator gardens. So that's something that will be in our pollinator toolkit and definitely shared in the workshops, but I think we can probably share a plant list um, before then as well. And I think too, Anne touched on this, but the, the problem with tropical milkweed is um, it's kind of twofold or maybe even threefold, I'm not really sure, but what, one of the biggest problems is the, the parasitic protozoa, the OE protozoa, I'm sure most of you guys have heard of that, that um, um, tends to concentrate on the tropical milkweed because it doesn't die back. It, that protozoa is also on the, the native milkweeds, but because they die back, the protozoa dies back with it. But on the tropical milkweed, it just get, gets to uh, keep reinfecting the monarchs through the um, larvae. And then that the protozoa actually goes from the larval stage into the adult monarch and, and that, um, parasite itself, if it doesn't kill the adult monarch, it definitely weakens it. And if a female monarch is continually laying her eggs on the same plants because they're always available and not going into diapause, um, the chances of that OE parasite, protozoan parasite building up in the, in the monarch is, is pretty detrimental. And then also the effects of having a food source, a continual food source at one location and how that affects um, the desire to monarch to, to uh, migrate within the monarchs. It's um, if it's if it's got a continual food source, it's probably just going to stay in the same place and once again not go into sexual diapause and just keep breeding and laying eggs. So um, 
there's a there's a lot to know there about why tropical milkweed is a problem but the if you've got it already in your garden the easiest thing to do is just keep it cut back from october to um march and mimic what the native milkweeds do Well, thank you uh, to all our presenters. That was a really fantastic presentation. In, in the background as a host, I was able to actually watch most of it. And um, um, I will mention a couple things. I put this into the chat, but most importantly, all the links that you'll need will be on the event page on our main website. So if you go to cmpssd.org, and just go to the calendar and click on today's date. You'll find uh, some additions, including uh, how to pull up a recording of this presentation in case maybe you missed the first part or wanna watch, watch it again. Um, I've also mentioned in the chat that seeds for three species, the Asclepius fasicularis, the Areocarpa, and uh, Asclepius uh, speciosa, are available. I, I just checked our um, sales sites uh, where we sell uh, over 100 species of, of California native seeds. So you can purchase those and have them mailed to your house. And finally, I'll say that we will uh, be having a, our first winter plant sale. And that is starting uh, Monday at 8 p.m., the ordering. And it's a kind of ready, set, go until 180 orders come in. Um, back in the fall, that took less than 24 hours. So I just wanna let you know if you want plants, <laughs> get in there and the fasicularis plants will be available at the sale. I, I also know that Earth Discovery Institute has one or two plant sales um, each year. Just one in the fall one fall sale. So um, that will be another source. And um, I hope everyone can get their milkweed game going and that the Pollinator Alliance is facilitating um, more successful seeds uh, and plants that can be used throughout the county. So thank you again, presenters, and um, everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hanging in there and it's ending. It's great. <laughs>